The responses to my first video concerning Noah's Flood, including attempts by young Arthur creationists to explain the Flood, prompted me to post a follow-up video. In this video, I will explain exactly how the theory of plate tectonics came into being, and why it is among the most solidly supported theories in science. In the next video, we will return to how this relates to the hydroplate theory. The hypothesis of continental drift was originally proposed by Alfred Wagner in 1915. He had four lines of evidence to support his hypothesis. The first was the fit of the continents. As is well known, in many areas, the coastlines of the continents appear to fit together like a jigsaw. For example, the coast of South America and Africa appear to fit. Wagner's skeptics countered that. It's a pure coincidence. The shape of these continents is an absolute pure coincidence based upon the water level. Kent Hovind is actually right. The shape of the coastlines is completely dependent on the sea level. But more on that later. Wagner gave fossil evidence for continental drift. Fossils of the same species were found on completely separate continents. Not only that, they were consistent. For example, fossils found from the same time periods are found in the same areas. Third, Wagner's hypothesis explained why rocks and mountains of the exact same type, age, and composition are found in separate parts of the world. For example, the Appalachian Mountains of the eastern U.S. have the exact same age and composition as the mountains in northern Scotland and in Scandinavia. Wagner proposed that these mountains were once part of a single mountain range that split apart. The geologic record from sites in the subtropics between 220 and 300 million years ago show that they were covered in ice sheets at the time, while sites in the northern hemisphere appear to be tropical swamps. There is little way to explain this other than by having the continents themselves move. Continental drift was rejected by scientists at the time because there was no feasible way for continents to plow through sea floor. Without a mechanism for movement, the theory languished for decades. But by the middle of the 20th century, more evidence pertaining to continental drift had surfaced. First of all, surveys of the depth profile of the sea floor had discovered the continental shelf, this relatively shallow water stretching out from the coastline for an average of 50 miles. The shelf eventually drops off rapidly into the abyssal plain. It turns out that the continental shelves of the continents, which do not change like the coastlines do, fit together very well, much better than the coastlines. Another thing was discovered in these depth profiles. The mid-ocean ridge is found in every ocean and is the largest mountain range on Earth. In addition, many ridges have a rift valley in their center, indicating that the ridge is being pulled apart. Other lines of evidence began to appear at around the same time. Paleomagnetism is the study of ancient magnetic fields using iron-rich igneous rock. When the rock is molten, iron crystals point in the direction of the magnetic field, like microscopic compasses. When the rock solidifies, the crystals are frozen in position. In this way, we can determine the direction of the ancient magnetic field in relation to the rock being studied. What was discovered was a phenomenon named polar wandering. It appeared that the magnetic poles had been moving all throughout Earth's history. The problem arose when scientists compared positions of the poles as measured by rocks on different continents. For example, ancient rocks in North America and Asia placed the North Pole at completely different positions. Obviously, there has never been two North Poles. Instead, the solution is that the continents themselves had moved, while the poles had remained relatively stationary. It was not long before a mechanism was provided for the movement of the continents, seafloor spreading. At the mid-ocean ridges, magma moves up from the mantle to create new seafloor, while seafloor is returned to the mantle in deep ocean trenches. The continents were never plowing through the seafloor. Instead, both the seafloor and the continents were drifting on top of the molten mantle. In addition to providing a mechanism for how the continents could move, answering problems with polar wandering, finding the same fossils, rocks, and mountains on different continents, the fate of the continental shelf, and finding prehistoric glaciers in the subtropics, this also explains why we cannot find seafloor anywhere that is more than 200 million years old. This is not even mentioning that we have measured the movement of the plates through GPS monitoring. It turns out that in the real world, the crust is much more complex. The Earth's crust is divided into plates, whose boundaries usually lie on trenches, mid-ocean ridges, mountain ranges, island chains, or fault lines. Using these geographic features, combined with GPS measurements of the movement of the crust and the frequency of volcanoes and earthquakes, we can construct an accurate picture of where the boundaries of each plate are. But why are these features associated with plate boundaries? Mid-ocean ridges are formed from two plates moving apart, creating new sea floor. When this divergent boundary is on a continent, a rift zone with increased geologic activity is formed. Eventually, the continent will break apart, creating a small sea, and over millions of years, an ocean. Trenches only form when heavier crust collides with lighter crust, with the heavier crust sinking below the lighter crust. This can either be seafloor colliding with 
lighter seafloor, or seafloor meeting a continent whose crust is always much lighter than oceanic crust. This process is not smooth and can result in earthquakes. Island chains are also formed when two plates collide. As one plate sinks into the mantle, it heats up and starts to melt. The molten magma is lighter than the surrounding rock and mantle, and it starts to rise. The magma will eventually surface in the form of volcanoes. The volcanoes may eventually create islands if they are underwater. If they are on land, they may create mountain ranges. This effect causes a pattern. All trenches in the middle of the ocean have an island chain on one side, while all coastal trenches have a mountain range on their coast. If two slabs of continental crust collide, for the crust will buckle and rise to form mountain ranges. Finally, two plates can also simply slide past each other. The friction from this process will create earthquakes, but may also result in a fault line. Anybody seeking to offer an alternative to plate tectonics must explain all of this if they want the theory to be taken seriously. The hydroplate theory fails to do this. Not only that, but it blatantly contradicts the data we have collected throughout the years. It ignores the evidence even the evidence that the young earth creationists claim support it. This will be the topic of my next video.